I'm Laura Vinroot Poole. For 20 years, I've owned Capital, an internationally recognized specialty store. Capital has never really been about fashion. It's always been about people. What We Wore was created to share the meaningful journeys that inspire me. From the designers and friends I meet on the road to the men and women with whom I work each day. Everybody wants to know her name. Ruth Runberg is a former buyer at Brown's, Barney's, and here at Capitol. I have always been drawn to her love of storytelling and her exquisite taste. She recently founded R. Runberg Curiosities, which brings furniture and accents from around the world to the South. This is episode four of our five-episode capsule in partnership with Garden and Gun. Ruth Runberg, I am so excited to have you here six feet away during (laughs) (laughs) COVID-19 social distancing. You're nice to break away from homeschooling to be with me this morning. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Actually, so excited to be here. I came yesterday (laughs) and no one was here. I I pulled up and I thought, hmm, something feels wrong. (laughs) It's so weird, though. Every day I ask my family, I'm like, what day is today? Is it Wednesday or Thursday? And it is like, you, this is so, it sounds so pretentious, but you know when you, you only know what day it is from whether it's Wednesday in New York Times is food section, Thursday is style section, and you just sort of have to think back to what you read in the morning in the paper. Well, I can understand that. I have May, who um, has an actual old school paper calendar on oh, the wall. It. And she tells me all the time, Mama, you need a calendar. I'm like, oh, I have a calendar on my phone. She said, no, but you never know what the day is. I have to say, we know each other in a different way than I've known any other of my podcast guests. I I remember when your mother was pregnant with you. (laughs) Your brother was my first boyfriend, my fourth and fifth grade boyfriend, I think. Your mother is this beautiful, tall, redhead And I think we were kind of old for our moms to be pregnant, you know, so it was sort of this really weird, I mean, good, weird, but really different thing. And it was very memorable to me. Oh, there are a lot of connections we have for sure. (laughs) So you're from Charlotte. I am. Tell me about growing up here. Gosh, growing up in Charlotte was great. It was a lot. It was a different city than it is today in a lot of ways. It was certainly smaller people wise. And I think the weather in North Carolina, because of where we're situated, makes a big difference in how you live your life. We have four distinct seasons, which Mm -hmm. is really nice. So I grew up a lot outside because you could be outside. I spent a lot of time riding bikes around the neighborhood, going from backyard to backyard, from trampoline to trampoline. (laughs) And I had a, a tree house in the backyard I spent a lot of time in and... I've thought about you actually a lot during COVID-19 because (laughs) I think that I've never experienced Charlotte as when we grew up as as much as I have during this time, you know? I totally agree. It's so weird. I feel like I'm transported to 1977. I know exactly what you mean, and I've said that to a number of people, particularly at the beginning when um, we were home, but not quite as Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have the the restrictions that were as it it just was sort of like be home it wasn't be home and be away from people and right so all the kids were out riding bikes and (laughs) neighbors were out walking Mm -hmm. and it was just delightful it occurred to me that it's because we're all so scheduled now and we weren't when we were growing up maybe you you had had ballet once a week and you know church choir and handbells (laughs) once a week or something but um you didn't have activities and People were outside, so that's one thing that's really nice, has been really nice about people slowing down and having having less to do Mm -hmm. outside of just being home. I think one of the things I've noticed is that, one, I'm not tired, (laughs) which I think I'm just, like, constantly tired from my job and trying to just balance, not balance, but, like, 
be a wife, be a mother, be a business person, travel, not be jet lagged. I mean, all those things. I feel like I'm tired all the time. And I think it's the first time in 25 years that I've not been tired. And so I listen and I really hear what everybody's saying to me. And I think that that feels really different. And that's pathetic, but it's true, <laughs> you know. And, and I think my family has gotten along better than we ever have just because I'm, I think I'm really listening to what they're saying. Well, I guess you're not having to think forward to what you're going to be doing next. Or yeah. There's, there's just less clutter in your mind. There's less, mm-hmm. less pressure to go, go, go and do. I mean, you maintain an incredible schedule. I think particularly for me, I'm, I'm not great at changing gears between being a mom, being a small business owner, all the different things that being a wife, being a friend, being, um, you always that's said you, challenging for me. You always said you were not a great multitasker and Perry, my husband says nobody's a good multi, I mean, it's, he says it's not possible to be a great multitasker. It's, it's not, it's not fair. It's very taxing on me and I because, feel like well, I don't do also, anything well. Well, you're such a perfectionist, I think. And so I think that you, yeah, you want to do everything the right way. And I think that's hard when you're doing multiple things at once. Well, I've, tried to work on work on that I I, (laughs) perfectionism is is a a gift and a curse it's really a curse actually it's not a healthy way to be but I think that I've tried to be more comfortable as I've gotten older with being messy Mm -hmm. and not letting what is it don't let great get in the way of good yeah and being a little bit more relaxed about the standards I set for myself you can't do everything really really well Mm -hmm. so I think you have to pick and choose how you spend your time I I think quarantine's been great for that too I mean I've given myself so much more grace than I usually do I love your parents you have very creative parents tell me how that influenced you oh gosh they are they are so creative and they love you (laughs) (laughs) we do love each other my dad is is very creative with building and planting and My mom is also very creative. She could sew anything. She made a lot of my clothes when I was growing up. She was in the buying program. She was. She was in a buyer training program um, in Birmingham. She's from Alabama. When she was in her 20s, she's from Alabama. Yeah. And um, she has a great eye. I I think I honed my eye for quality early on because (laughs) I spent many, many hours trailing behind my mom at TJ's and Marshall's (laughs) and Lowman's and... um, (laughs) All her haunts, um, she could zero in on the find mm-hmm. on a rack back when there were still truly finds. At Remember those... how awesome Lemons was? Oh, my beginning. gosh. That was insane. She could really zero in on the best piece on the rack that was the highest quality. And and, and you also had you have good genes from your Aunt Jane, who has wonderful taste, too. Oh, yes. My Aunt, my aunt Jean. Jean, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. I have an Aunt Jane, too, oh, actually. I, I, my mom's one of six. <laughs> oh, I forgot. She is one of six. <laughs> my Aunt Jean, you have met. She's something else. They broke the mold after her. And <laughs> What she, was her style like? Tell me about her. Oh, gosh. You know, kind of like my mom and my aunt are sort of like yin and yang style <laughs> Style influences, I guess. My my mom loved t- really classic, tailored, beautiful fabric. I've envisioned her in my childhood wearing like a pleated midi skirt and a, a blazer with shoulder pads and <laughs> kind of like a princess dialogue. And then my Aunt June was much more, more fun. I, I think about my cousin's weddings and what everybody wore (laughs) and it was just so different from what you'd see at a wedding in Charlotte where people would be in more tailored clothes and a string of pearls and a black sheath dress or something in Birmingham their weddings people were in you know sequins and paillettes and (laughs) color and it felt more bold and I I guess my aunt always wore really bright colors and bright lipstick I think we always had that in common because I have my Florida cousins (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it was we would go visit them and I think it's the same thing they're just so other like so different and like these goddesses they're nothing like what you're used to and um, they're so inspiring yes yes <laughs> yeah my Alabama family always felt kind of sophisticated and and, and they smoked and stuff like that yes yeah. and cussed and yeah <laughs> Sorry, yeah. sorry to call y'all out if you're listening. Um, growing up, I definitely, I was definitely influenced by both. And, you know, my mom also, I'll say, was really good about underscoring the need to be appropriate and be respectful and to make sure that y- you thought about what you're going to and that yeah. what you're wearing is 
is going to be the right thing and in the right of the audience i mean right. appropriate when in rome i think that you're unusual in fashion you came from finance and moved into fashion which i don't think that typically happens <laughs> you started uh, with an internship at the stock exchange i think i did I did. In, in college, I got an internship on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, which was awesome. And it was definitely a different time. It was sort of the end of an era at the stock exchange mm-hmm. then because people were still on the floor. Humans were still on the floor <laughs> using the traditional kind of hand signals and shouting. That's and, so cool. Um, that was an amazing experience. And what did you think about it? I and also, what it. did you wear? Well, for the stock exchange, women were required to have their legs covered if you were on the floor, uh-huh. and you had to have closed-toed shoes. And so if you wore... And that was just because of, like, danger of the ticker tapes or, like, what? You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it was a safety thing. I don't know if it was a decorum thing. But yet another way that it was kind of the end of an era. Because this was, let's see, 2000, I guess. Is that right? Yeah, I wore like skirt suits and uh-huh. and with like a collared blouse underneath it and <laughs> there was not a lot of flair to it <laughs> but it was a great experience being in New York and I thought New York was fascinating because I think you'll attest growing up in Charlotte that we grew up in a place that is fairly was fairly non-ostentatious yes. so it was kind of a drive the Volvo till it dies kind of a place <laughs> or the Buick you know. for sure or the Buick <laughs> To be in New York, I, I was just wide-eyed at the consumption. Flash. And, right, all the, and, and glamour. I mean, it felt yeah. glamorous to me, which is something I've always yearned for and kind of been attracted to, a, kind of a sense of glamour or sophistication. And it's the Alabama sequence. It is. I was always, I was always <laughs> chasing Alabama. I found Alabama in New York. I love it. One thing I did that summer, I took the opportunity while in New York, and particularly because I had market hours. So when the markets closed, I was off. Right. So I reached out to various alums who were living in New York, who were in the, the finance industry, and asked them if I could come meet with them and just talk to them about what they do, mm-hmm. just to learn about what different jobs were available. And so I met with a woman who worked for J.P. Morgan, and she covered retail companies Hmm. in investment banking. And she put this pitch book in front of me that was all about, um, I think it was a Pashmina company, actually, a a Shawls company. (laughs) And it was the first time I had ever seen kind of this meeting of worlds of the business side of fashion, that this meeting of worlds that I loved and was interested in. And so there was consumer psychology and there was thinking about colors and fabrics and then but it was all bundled in this financial framework and I thought gosh this is exactly what I should do I should go into investment banking and I'll cover retail companies I applied to banks and got a job at Morgan Stanley and started that following summer um, and was placed in the real estate group (laughs) (laughs) and that was fun I actually did we had a real estate fund and I actually did pitch a, a deal to do something with Prada's debt because everybody else in the morning would sit in our cube and they'd have the Wall Street Journal open. Right, you'd um, have Women's Wear Daily. And i have Women's Wear Daily. <laughs> and from there you went to Barney's. How did that happen? The analyst commitment was a two-year commitment, and um, I was trying to think about if I wanted to stay on for a third year or if I wanted to do something else. Ultimately, I decided that I wanted to work actually for a company that was in that industry as opposed to analyzing the numbers generated by by those companies my mom actually suggested that she reach out to your mom and ask (laughs) if you had any recommendations and you put me in touch with Elizabeth Elizabeth von der Goltz yes who's the buying director of Net-A-Porter yes but was it Barney's at the time I think well at the time she she was on a break Ah, she had been in California (laughs) yes she was in LA and she had been at in the buying offices at I Bindles. think Bindles and Barney's at yeah. that point. That changed the whole path yeah. um, of my career, that that wow. one. Um, so thank you, Judy. Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> thank you, Laura. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> and I talked with Elizabeth about what she did, and she was describing what it meant to be a buyer. And when I listened to her talk about it, I thought, this is exactly the job for me. Hmm. And so I started trying to get my foot in the door at 
one of the department stores in New York. Mm-hmm. And that was more challenging than I had anticipated. Huh. Because you hadn't had any retail experience? I, I don't know. I, I wonder if I, I had a different background yeah. from most of the, the backgrounds of people coming into to the buying programs, I think. And I'm sure they thought I was a nerd, you know, <laughs> like who's this banking kid, you know, trying to, but I gave notice at, at Morgan Stanley and I had, I don't know, I think I had a month and I called Barney's every day for a month and left a voicemail <laughs> with the HR department. I love it. I showed up at the, at the, at Barney's at the HR and no one would meet <laughs> with me. I just was baffled. I couldn't, I could not get my foot in the door. And my very last day at Morgan Stanley, I got a call from a woman in the HR department who said, there's a position available. Could you be here Monday to interview? And I said, absolutely. I hung up the phone and spun around in my cubicle to my (laughs) cube mates and said, guys, Barney's called back. I've got an interview. They said, what's the job? I said, I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) Do you remember what you wore? Oh, gosh. Most of my fashion all came from vintage shops. Yeah. So I uh, I had a Whiting and Davis kind of chain mesh huh. bag that I carried it was white. I carried that for my second my follow up interview with Judy Collinson, the woman yeah. who I ended up working for. She was the GMM of the women's buying office at the time at Barney's. And I was kind of insecure about it because I thought, gosh, I don't have a real designer handbag that I'm carrying in, you know. I'm, and I'm sure that was the first thing that she commented on about how, she, how much she loved it. I sat down and <laughs> she said, oh, she said, I collect Whiting and Davis handbags. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my gosh, <laughs> this is going to work. <laughs> Thank goodness. So you went on to work at the most iconic retailers in the world, really, Barney's, Saks, Brown's. What was your favorite role and what was the one that provided the most growth? Oh, gosh. Well, each role was so different. Barney's was formative for me because I started. And when I started, I was the administrative assistant to Judy, who's mm-hmm. the the head of the buying office. So I was the floor secretary. So I bet you um, were really good at that. <laughs> Seriously. I brought a lot of investment banking intensity to, <laughs> to, to my administrative assistant job. But I can tell you, the, the bankers kind of looked at me like, you're leaving investment banking to be a secretary to a department store? And I was like, that's right. <laughs> Read it and weep, baby. They're, they're like, okay, <laughs> maybe you better go. Right. It was a really neat way to start and kind of an unorthodox beginning to starting in a buying career. Yeah. Because typically you would start as, as an assistant buyer. Right. And I started out as the assistant to the head. I got to know all the buyers on the floor because I was always taking memos to them or yeah. picking things up or setting up meetings for them. I met all the people, all the senior fashion industry people who would come in to have meetings with Judy. All the designers, I'm sure. All the designers and all the CEOs. I'd spend a day, you know, unjamming printers and changing toner <laughs> cartridges and running memos, but then I'd, I'd answer I'd answer her phone and I'd get to talk to, you know, the CEO of Prada. Right. And that'd be like all I needed <laughs> for the for the whole day, I would say, oh, my gosh, I've got the most glamorous job. What so, an amazing time to be there, especially in light of what's happened. It since. was an amazing time. Yeah. Um, the it, most creative time. It, it was kind of, again, the end of another era yeah. as Net-A-Porte had just started online selling. Mm-hmm. And so Barney's and some of the other department stores were scrambling to to get a website up. And so that was one of my first big, big responsibilities was to kind of organize all the inputs for all the different items to go onto the website. Wow. And I'll never forget, I went into Judy's office one day and said, Judy, I, and keep in mind, I was like staying until like eight o'clock, you know, everybody else <laughs> left at, you know, 630. And I was always the last person there. I took my, my, my job very seriously. Anyway, I went into Judy's office and I said, um, Judy, so I just wanted to let you know that I got all of the Leroy things updated in the system. And she kind of looked over it. She wore these horn rims kind of glasses and she sort of slid them down her nose and looked up at me. She had this blonde bob. And she said, Ruth, she said, it's not Leroy, it's Loire. <laughs> and, 
And I started laughing. And I, Did I she thought, laugh? Mm, Loa. That sounds a lot better than Leroy. I mean, L-E-R-O-Y, where I'm from, you'd say Leroy, Loa, right? Loa. She said, Ruth, it's Loa. <laughs> so, so I signed up for um, elementary French, French classes after that. <laughs> From Barney's, you moved on to Saks, and your first buying appointment, you don't have to say who the designer was, but I love the story you tell that you were doing the calculations before the appointment (laughs) to see what the sell-through was. Is this the one where I was noticing that we we had lost money season after season with (laughs) this? It was like a negative, it was not a 0% sell-through, it was like a negative 15% sell-through or something. It was something crazy. Yeah, it was something crazy. And uh, but our buys were planned up or right. something like exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I had these massive spreadsheets filled with uh, like data. the smallest <laughs> numbers you've ever seen printed out. And I was reading through this multi-page document and, and trying to understand the the business with this one particular partner we had before we went into, before I went into the meeting the next day with the senior buyer. It, it was one of those deals where I was, I was like, so I was trying to move the decimal over two places thinking like, is this a percentage or is it, you know, right. something is, something's not making sense. And so I looked at it and looked at it and I thought, no, I think this is an error. And I went into the woman I was working with and, and, and said, you know, I think I found an error in this. And it just doesn't make sense that we would have had, you know, this poor of a performance a zero season sell through. <laughs> and yet we're and planned to buy more this season and she kind of looked at me like you know come on <laughs> get with girl, the program you know <laughs> and that's the first time anybody said to me well we're partners and we expect the designer to share in the loss the loss <laughs> of the season and so that was my introduction to margin agreements and yeah. and The fact that you might have an agreement with a designer at the start of a season and you would say, I expect this season to make X amount in margin. And if we don't, then you'll write me a check or you'll take back unsold inventory or you'll take back unsold inventory and write me a check. Which which how did any designers survive that? I mean, what a crazy ridiculous well, they're not I no mean, i know exactly <laughs> and the department stores aren't either because exactly. what ends up happening is i think when you take when you take the pressure off of a buyer to create a very right. directed specific buy f- f- with a, a point of view yeah which is really in my opinion the job of a buyer when you take the the pressure off off of them by saying, you know, you're going to have this kind of stopgap where if it doesn't sell, you can send it back. Then all of a sudden, you don't have to be as selective about what you choose. And so, for example, if you have an entire brand that's on consignment, meaning that anything that doesn't sell gets sent back to the designer, then you're less likely to be discriminating about what you put on your floor because, you know, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like, well, why not? Just throw it out there. See if it sticks. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is this is the model that's happened across stores across the world. And so have you ever felt like you go in a store in London, it looks just like this, a different store in New York and everyone's got the same stuff Simulacra. and the same. Yeah. It's, it's, it's because people aren't being forced to buy with an edit anymore. Yeah. And so it makes the shopping experience less magical and less interesting from a sort of fashion ethics perspective a lot of inventory is produced that really should never have been produced. Right. More inventory is produced than is ever going to sell right now. Right. And it's a big problem. The this the fashion industry is responsible for so much of waste, uh, waste and environmental damage in the world right now. If there's anything good to say that maybe we can look back on and say came out of COVID-19, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps the fashion model will change a bit. Let's I, hope so. I, I know that a lot of people in the industry are talking about it more so than ever. What's going to happen to consumerism post COVID? You came from Saks to me to work with <laughs> with us in 2007, I think, which was is such a talk about a trajectory like the height, height, height of consumerism <laughs> to 2008, the end of the world. <laughs> you created our entire buying program and put in all the systems and controls within our you made the department which was life-changing business-changing but also I think in dealing with COVID-19 really I think you and I and the people that went through that at that time you know Jenny Catherine Nicole all Mm -hmm. of us 
I think there's a different resilience. And who knows what will happen through this or when, when or if this will ever end. <laughs> but I do think that we survived that. And I feel like I have a totally different perspective than I would have had. Um, I always say I'm grateful for it, but really, really grateful for that experience, no matter how horribly awful and scary and hard it was. I, I can see that. Well, and, don't and, and it was remember. different then also, Ruth, because the, it, it was different then because it felt like, uh, honestly, like the luxury industry was the only, we were sort of the only people that were really affected. I don't mm -hmm. know. Not, that's not true, but. I know what you mean by that. We it, were affected in a different way than everybody else, I guess. Right. Well, there was such an awareness of. Conspicuous consumer. Conspicuous consumption, which, you know, I think shows the resilience of the industry because what emerged from that sort of avoidance of conspicuous consumption Phoebe Philo and Celine yeah so everything we right. went from I mean don't you remember that last season in Paris I think that while you and I were in Paris Lehman fell right at first union did and uh, Lehman I mean it and we were over in Paris and <laughs> and I mean don't you remember I I mean first of all there was there there was the the shoes were like the oh platforms were sky high. The, the Nicholas heels. Kirkwood, those things that were really like you could, <laughs> they were like clown shoes. You couldn't yeah. walk. Everything was sky high shoes and sequins. feathers and sequins. <laughs> and it was the most over the top, yep. decadent kind of ridiculousness. Last hurrah <laughs> that everyone was wearing. I, I specifically remember in the middle of the day in Paris, walking across Place Vendôme with you and seeing people literally dragging furs behind them. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I look back on that now and think, man, what we were wearing was so decadent and over the top and um, kind of ushered in a new era of austerity. Yeah, so, which was so beautiful. Which was so oh beautiful God. and felt so nice. When, when Phoebe showed that first season it kind of pushed a reset button and fashion completely changed from well, one and season also, to the next and I do think you're right the shoes I mean remember Lanvin with the ballet flats and then Phoebe with the vans right uh, and that was so crazy and I can remember clients saying oh, oh I could I could never wear a flat you know like that just doesn't happen <laughs> right. I don't wear flats you know <laughs> isn't it wild what? and then now everybody's wearing sneakers I yeah mean, it's, going <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's amazing how it evolved we did some fun and crazy things together and I have such great memories what are some Me of too. your favorite memories other than crying and laughing <laughs> at the uh, I mean I people everybody was singing together at the long bench oh my gosh that's exactly what I was going to say <laughs> is that long bench show you know we spend so much time trying to convince people of how much work it is because it really is I mean yeah. it, it's a grueling job it is a lot of work many people start in fashion and don't continue because it's a hard business and yeah. anyone who has spent you know longer than a few years in fashion knows how challenging it is and you work, have to be a warrior you have to be tough yeah but all that being said <laughs> it's also glamorous and it's also fun it's all the things you think it is and more yeah I do. I think about that Lomvin show a lot. That that was an amazing show. I wish I could remember the song. Do you it, remember? I, yeah, the I do. It was, song? A, it was a disco song. It was like a Donna Summer song or something. I think you're. It was. You're exactly <laughs> right. It was sort of a soar, like soaring strings kind of disco. Yeah. And all, and all the 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 final Walk looks came out, and then all the models circled back out again, and then Albert came out and was dancing. He was dancing. Yeah. And everyone in the audience. In the stands, arms I mean, was, around each other, we're hugging each other. <laughs> People were crying. People were crying. It was the most emotional. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was I mean, it, so be you know, Albert at his height was just the most beautiful thing in the world. It really was. Yeah, um, he was a master, and oh. it was like this moment of the lion lying down with the lamb. I mean, <laughs> I remember also um, the Mark Jacobs show when he used to show in the armory yeah. near near the Indian restaurant we always went to. Oh before. yeah, 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 downtown, yeah. <laughs> And we were waiting for the show. We hung out with Russell Simmons. Yes. In the, in the we brown bagged it with Russell. We did. Okay, so for everyone listening, there's an amazing um, Indian restaurant called Bati in Curry Hill, in, yeah. in the Murray Hill area, right yeah. near the Armory. We always plan to eat there before the Marc Jacobs show. <laughs> and at the time, it was BYOB, the, the policy at the restaurant right, was. Right. So we would get usually beers from the convenience <laughs> store across the street. 
truly in brown bags and take it with us to the Indian restaurant before the show started. Mark is also notoriously hours and hours late. Hours late. <laughs> and so you, you know, you could pop out and go see if it looked like <laughs> things were moving along. And if right. not, like come sit back down, have some more naan, have a sip of your beer. And somehow we met Russell Simmons, like in yeah. the convenience store, right? Yes. In the bodega in the and, bodega and hung out with him for, and I think and went to the show we with sat on the curb and drank <coughs> beers in brown bags I remember the show maybe the first show after the recession it was like the spring yeah. after the recession had been in the fall and it was so ethereal and beautiful and hopeful yeah it's a, it's amazing how the shows can carry so much emotion well and there's such a reflection of the times absolutely what is great taste to you oh gosh to me taste is just so personal I think trends are interesting, but what I think is more interesting is how people interpret them and make them their own. Yeah. Taste to me is not necessarily, I, you know, anybody can look, can buy runway look number 17 from head to toe. But what, <laughs> what has always been interesting to me is mixing one element of it with something, you know, old and something you've dug out of the back of your closet or your beloved pair of jeans and kind of creating this mashup of things that that turns it into your look and your style it's been so inspiring to watch you start your business our runberg curiosities will you tell me about the business and why you started it and tell me about it i created a business in which i source and sell unusually beautiful treasures for the home that's everything from furniture to accent pieces to accessories and objects. The curiosities part, really, I know it sounds like I sell, you know, specimens floating in (laughs) jars or something. But to me, a curiosity is just something that has a story behind it. And most of what I buy has a really interesting story, whether it's about who made it. Most everything that I carry is made by human hands and was difficult to make is unusual or rare, hard to find. And most everything is meant to last forever and be kept and cherished to create a home that has layers that really reflect who you are and how you want to feel in your home. Mm. So I started this about a year and a half ago. I wasn't sure how it would go. I'd never, I'd never bought interiors before. I think by the end of my career in fashion, I had bought everything that you, <laughs> you could buy in fashion from jewelry to shoes to bridal. I was excited to try something new. And um, I went back for my first market. I went to Maison Objet in Paris, which I'd always wanted to go to yeah. and even had had tickets to go to at one point, and And it fell through um, when I was working at Brown's. And it was a situation in which I knew so much about one industry, fashion, that it made me realize how little I knew about another industry. Yeah. So as far as the nuts and bolts of how they do business and, and um, did it translate or no, it's very not different. Really? D- even just the pricing, there's no wholesale and retail. There's oh. typically, they talk in terms of discounts and a discount from, from retail or net and a lot less regulated than fashion. They don't have as many guidelines in place about pricing or huh. it's like, it's, it's a little bit like the wild, wild west. We both love jewelry and stones, and especially from Jaipur, (laughs) Indian stones. And I do think there's a little of that in the the stones are not graded or rated or whatever, but it's uh, how beautiful is it to you? You know, I don't don't know how much it is. The value is how much you would pay for it. Right. I read that in the Lonely Planet guidebook to Morocco a long time ago, something very similar to that. When I went on my first trip to Morocco, they talked about this, this, uh, (laughs) It's so funny, this experience that a lot of people have that they termed Medina rage. So Medina is the center of the city or where the market is. And I guess people kind of freak out sometimes in Morocco, Western people that go, we tend to want to know the price, like capital T price. Right. And there's often a, a bartering or a negotiating. Yeah. That goes back and forth and you do this kind of dance. And it's expected. It's expected. That's yeah. the way you do business. Yeah. And that freaks a lot of people out because people have in their minds that something has a price. Yeah. What is it worth? And what I read in The Lonely Planet, God was so wise. And of course, the economist in me loved it. It said, the price of an item is what it's worth to you. Yeah. What are you willing to pay for it? Yeah. And it sort of emphasized 
not to second guess yourself in the market. If you've bought something and you wonder if you got completely hoodwinked and <laughs> you know you paid way too much, just let it go. Like you, yeah. it's part of the experience. If you were willing to pay a hundred dollars for that rug, then that's what it's worth. It's worth a hundred dollars. And and that's, I remember we did that in Istanbul together. I mean, yes. we, and you you definitely prepared me for it in negotiating jewelry prices. It's not rage, but it's just like ang- anxiety or right. something. Right, because you're so worried that you're not paying what is the price come on what's the price and it's like speaking a different language tell me what success will look like for our own merg in the next year oh wow well corona has really (laughs) has really um (laughs) thrown a kink into things we had our our first um big selling event planned in a space outside of a home so my first few selling events have have been in my home. We've moved, you've come, you know, we've, we've moved all of our furniture upstairs and then replaced it with furniture and objects and accessories that, that you can buy. So it's kind of a shoppable home and we've invited people we know in our network and, and it's grown every time it's, it's grown to a broader group of people. So it's gotten big enough and it's gotten disruptive enough (laughs) to my family that it was time to, to take a space. And so we had plans for this week, this coming week, April 15th, to have an event at the Duke Mansion. Oh, wow. Which will happen. It's just going to be postponed, of course, maybe in June. I've got to work that out. We have really exciting things planned. And I have so much beautiful inventory to share and to show. But for the time being, things are going well. Yeah, very well. And very, very beautiful. This episode is in partnership with our friends at Garden and Gun. What's your favorite thing about the South? Or your favorite thing about being Southern? I'd have to say it's just the the way that we engage with each other and with other people. Southerners tend to be really tough. But um, there's also a gentleness and a warmness and an openness that I think is wonderful and really unique. There's a very unique Southern disposition and spirit that's welcoming and kind and hardworking, but with a sense of humor. And especially our North Carolina state motto, "Esse quam videri, to be rather than to seem. And I think that to me, for going through fashion with you in Europe and in New York, navigating this industry with you at that time, made it very clear kind of who we were and what we believed in. And it's just different. I agree. You know, you and I used to always laugh because it felt like sometimes the bar was very low (laughs) to be regarded as the nicest person in fashion. Yeah, you're like, okay, great. (laughs) It was sort of like, really, it's just kind of being normal. But there's a lot of ego and a lot of attitude and a lot of chutzpah, a lot of (laughs) smoke and mirrors in fashion. And I think you're right that to be rather than to seem means – to just come and be yourself and when you're comfortable with who you are and where you're from Mm -hmm. and what you're about and you get to go back to yeah that stable base when you when you're done with all your travels I think that's really something I do too Ruth tell me what you wore to the prom (laughs) (laughs) oh gosh I wore a strapless short dress which was kind of radical because everyone was wearing long yeah. gowns was it victor costa <laughs> no <laughs> no it wasn't it was bronze sparkly and it was 1997 so it was kind of like we were moving into that kate moss there was like the seattle um right, influence brunch. and right. slip dresses and you know carolyn Bissett kennedy and we were sort of moving into that 90s or I guess we're moving out of the 90s, look. And so this was a strapless kind of sheath dress that was above the knee, and it was um, really thin and kind of straight, but kind of fitted. And, yeah, that was it. It, it had sparkle. It had a mat- Oh, my gosh, it was actually kind of gross. It was like, a, <laughs> it was like some kind of Lurex blend, <laughs> but it was really pretty. It didn't feel great, but it was really pretty. And I had big pearl... Pearl clip-on earrings that had a pearl, like, teardrop hanging from them. (laughs) Really chunky. Yeah. And I had strappy shoes 
that, that were bronze that were bronze love it mm-hmm. and I had a little clutch that I have to this day that it was beaded I bought it at one of the department stores in Charlotte it was the whole thing was covered in beads and it was a um a leopard print I love it yeah it was kind of a radical look it sounds really pretty thank you I love being with you it's been <laughs> so delightful What We Wore is produced by Capital and Balto Creative Media. The original song, Someone So Enchanting, was composed and performed by Britt Drazda. is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com.